just takes a moment and we'll get started. Um, mm -hmm. All right, almost there. Okay. All right, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, the New York Studio School Virtual Evening Lecture Series. Uh, it is really my great pleasure tonight to be introducing my colleague, Ilsa Murdoch, and her talk, Enter Even Everything. Um, we are very excited to have Ilsa here tonight. So I wanna thank her for taking the time to, to talk about her work. And I want to thank all of you for joining us in the audience from wherever you are on um, what is a chilly New York evening here in the city. Uh, I would also like to quickly recognize that the New York Studio School Evening Lecture Series is generously supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Robert Lehman Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, it also would not be possible without the many individual contributors. Um, so thank you uh, if you've contributed before and if, um, if not, please do consider making a donation either during or after tonight's talk by clicking on the support button on our homepage at www.myss.org. Um, and thank you so much. Um, just before I introduce Ilsa, I would like to um, just point out the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and the chat button, I'm sure we're all very familiar with on Zoom now, but do feel free to enter questions at any point during the talk. And um, Ilsa's actually re requested that too. So we might try and field some of the questions in real time. Um, and then we'll leave time at the end of the talk for uh, sort of a proper Q and A. Um, all right. And with that, Ilsa Sorensen Murdoch studied perceptual painting at the New York Studio School and went on to take courses in philosophy and religious studies at New York University. <clears throat> she then earned a BFA from Parsons School of Design in 2000 and an MFA from Rutgers University at the Mason Burroughs School of Arts in 2009. She has been the resident of the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, Edward F. Albee Foundation, DNA Provincetown Residency in Vermont Studio Center. Her work has been exhibited extensively in the United States, including with Tibor Denage Gallery here in New York. And most recently, uh, Ilsa received the 2019 Cultural Award Grant from the American Scandinavian Society, um, which concluded in an exhibition at the Try, <laughs> Try Give Lie Gallery, sorry Ilsa, um, here in New York last year. Uh, she was included in a survey of painting here and now at the Center for Contemporary Art in Bedminster, New Jersey, also last year, and she, Ilsa Murdoch, is on the faculty here at the New York Studio School. So it's my great pleasure, uh, and please join me in welcoming Ilsa Murdoch, Enter Even Everything. Thank you so much, Sam. And um, I do wanna thank also the New York Studio School for hosting me and to Graham Nixon as well for inviting me to speak tonight on my work. Um, it is, an especially great honor for me having been a student um, at the studio school myself um, from 93 to 97 um, and uh, attending this lecture series night after night um, during those three years um, and uh, thinking back then that if at some point I ever got to speak and host a lecture myself I must have made it somewhere <laughs> and here I am <laughs> and here we are on Zoom. So um, I think with that, I'll just dive right in. Um, I'm gonna show, um, well, actually Sam is going to um, run the um, slides. Um, so I'm gonna have, I'm gonna ask him as we go, it might take him a, mo a moment to <laughs> load up the lecture, I guess, here we go. Um, so this is, um, sorry, I'm just going to alter, uh, I guess I can't alter the view, that's okay. Um, 
So uh, I'm going to show you some current works first, and then um, I do have a couple paintings from the time when I was at the studio school, and then I'll, I'll move towards, um, you know, back from there towards where I am now, <laughs> um, where the work has um, progressed to. So um, here's a recent painting. This is from 2020. This painting is on, um, the inner painting part is on, wood, um, found wood. I work on a lot of repurposed materials. And um, so the wood itself is found. The painting is painted outdoors in the landscape. Um, I've been working um, in a kind of plein air um, way for the last, uh, it's been over 10 years now, um, strictly, strictly outdoor painting. Um, I, I actually prefer to call it outdoor painting because um, when I'm working on these, um, it, it's not so much just about um, capturing the light or the image or the visual experience. It's also about um, sort of communing with nature and um, uh, sensing the location, the space, um, um, and the various influences on my um, body through sensations of um, temperature or wind or humidity or smells, um, um, sounds, you name it. Um, so just uh, something to keep in mind as I talk about these works. Um, I also have been working, um, as you can see in this painting, there's sort of a palette at the bottom um, though these paintings have the palette um, on the bottom of the painting. And surrounding this surface, this wood surface, is a selection of plastic caps. Um, they're caps that I collected. Um, actually sitting, um, talking to you from my studio in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and you could see if I move my screen upwards, <laughs> you can see my massive amount of uh, uh, plastic caps, my plastic cap collection. Um, I've been collecting caps for over 15 years and I think it'll become a little clearer later um, how this came to be. Um, but the caps, um, I sort of think of as the synthetic part of the paint, this overall piece and um, the painted center, the organic part. Um, and I, I'm interested in how the two can kind of exist together. Um, we could go to the next one. And that the caps could maybe have um, an influence on the painting, um, sort of a color influence usually, um, but that the, the color of the caps is um, one that comes from industry that, um, whereas the painting through mixing the palette the, the colors tend to be a more muted um, tone. Um, the caps are, um, you know, consistently in this circle shape. They're from the tops of bottles. And so they're um, meant to be held in the hand. They're designed, you know, through industry to sort of be attractive and to seduce the eye. So they tend to be very colorful or have cute designs, or sometimes they have, um, you know, like this, this piece at the top, you can see there's a little um, clear cap on top. It has actually a little game inside of it. Actually, there's two of them on it. This piece is called Simmer. Um, the caps, um, and the, the previous piece actually was called Smolder. Um, so the caps are meant, in a way they're designed and meant to be held in the hand and meant to be attractive. Um, and yet um, eventually they're meant to be seen. Otherwise they're meant to be seen, once they're used, they're meant to be seen as something that you would no longer want to save, that they'd be something that you would throw away. Um, I could go to the next. And um, so I've, I've been, um, interested in this idea that the this this item that um, would be considered something you know we would not want to be looking at or you should sort of um, want to look at and then not want to look at um, 
coexist with a painting, which is a sanctioned space of viewing. Um, so I, I like the idea. I'm not really trying to aestheticize these caps, um, meaning um, I, in a recent conversation um, with Karen Wilkin, we were hashing this out, but I'm not, you know, I'm not pounding them or painting them or cutting them up. They just, they exist wholly as they are. And um, I'm interested in them just hanging out together with the paintings um, and that they both may influence each other um, through the color, but that they are not actually changing each other. I think I'm using this material more in the, in the way that maybe um, Tony Fair or B. Wirtz would use it, you know, where the, the, the item, the refuse is fully um, itself in the piece um, and yet maybe slightly transforming in relationship to something else. Um, so I think that these, again, these paintings are all painted um, outdoors. And um, I think that's what I wanted to say so far in the caps. So we can go to the next. And we can move forward to, I think, what is a few of um, my studio school paintings. So I'm gonna jump way back in time. <laughs> um, we go to the next one. Also, I have a quick question. Um, oh yeah. Um, Erica is asking if the, if the, um, the cat framing or the painting comes first. Oh, great question. Yeah, um, I do all the paintings first outdoors. Um, they're not um, mostly not considering the eventuality of caps being around them. So really just an immediate response. Although on occasion there is, um, you know, that thought entering in now that I've done these a while. So there's starting to be sort of a painting image conversation between the two. Um, if that makes sense. So um, initially the paintings, and I think this will become more clear throughout the lecture, um, but um, these paintings are all one session, sort of one shot paintings. And um, so sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And the ones that are sort of somewhere in between, I like the idea that the caps could kind of come in and sort of complete that painting. So um, the, the, the the two materials are sort of completing each other. So that's how I decide which ones end up having the caps frames. So we could keep going to the next. Um, so I did wanna show you a couple of student works since, um, as I said, I was a student at the school and it, um, it was such a tremendous uh, moment in my life and um, really, really changed my life. There was, um, when I entered the school and found that, you know, people were so tremendously passionate about these sort of formal ideas like tone or, <laughs> you know, value. And I just, uh, like, it was almost like people were willing to, you know, go, go to fisticuffs over these ideas, um, I felt like, uh, yeah, this is the place for me because <laughs> I care that much about these things too. Um, it really changed my life and, and, and the lives of some of my family members and you know who you are. Um, so this would, this would be early on at the school and um, painting a, a full figure, full standing figure in a space and, and just the realization of that, um, that color could be unweighted, you know, that it wasn't, didn't need to be localized to the object. Um, so I started to feel in this painting a sense of the color and the paint becoming a little bit more like clay that I could sort of carve out the figure um, with it. And that was a thrilling realization. Um, I think up to that point, color had existed much more in like, you know, this thing is this color, so I'm gonna paint it that color. Um, this, this standing figure is, um, this, I'm sorry, this painting is, um, I think it was about five by six. So mm -hmm. the figure is smaller than life size, but still large in, in the painting. 
Next one. Okay, and this is kind of a strange piece, but um, it was a major event for me at the, the school. Um, I, at that time, you know, my fellow peers at the school, they were all diehards as well. <laughs> And um, we, I think this was in the second year, we um, designated a space to work on a semester long painting. And we were given the opportunity to create the setup. And um, in those days we painted from nine to one um, every day. And then there was also drawing for another four hours in the afternoon from two to six. So they were long days where we were working from observation very uh, rigorously. Um, and the idea here was that we could maybe work on a large, you know, extremely large painting for the duration of maybe a whole semester for the full, you know, three months or, or so. Um, but around this time, I, I was, um, you know, heard this idea um, that Matisse, um, would, um, he, he expressed that he, um, when painting on a rectangle, it was like he was finding the rectangle for the painting. And that if, if he was to be, you know, to try to paint that painting on a different size rectangle, he, he wouldn't be able to do it. It would actually have to be a totally new painting because there's a specific rectangle that works for each painting. And I, that really blew my mind. Um, so while I wanted to do a large painting, I uh, couldn't, I, I, I couldn't uh, decide what size the rectangle was. So I thought, why don't I um, use this semester to um, discover the rectangle for this setup? So I bought it, a huge piece of canvas. I think it was 10 by 12 or something like that. And um, I stretched it over a 24 by 24 inch um, stretcher bar and then, and then wound the remainder of that huge piece around the back. So it was almost like a parachute to the painting. And for the first, um, I don't know, for the first month I worked on that rectangle. Um, if you go to the next one, I can show you a little bit closer where that rectangle was. So you could see the edge of this painting has this ridge on it, that's where the original rectangle was. Um, um, so we can, you could actually go back to the previous one um, and you could see some other ridges in there too. But I, I painted a whole semester, I mean, sorry, a whole month on that first rectangle, repainting the painting every day, trying to find out if that was the right rectangle. And, um, you know, as this semester wore on, I, I realized, well, I gotta expand this now because. <laughs> how do I know this is it unless I go bigger? And eventually I did scale up to a very large, you know, dimension. And um, again, was repainting this every day, originally in acrylic and then moved on um, and, and to oil eventually. Um, and be, because of where I was situated, I was in front of this globe that you see in the foreground. Um, so this globe started to, you know, sort of become a stand-in in a way for the figure um, and sort of started to have its own content. Um, and then, you know, fast forward, I tried an enormous um, nine by 10 painting and then I cut into it and this, we were reaching the end of the semester and this was my final attempt. <laughs> find the rectangle <laughs> and I repainted it on the final day in oil. And this is what you see here. Um, so it's not so much um, about, you know, I, I think that I could have kept going on this one, <laughs> but um, what was moving to me was this uh, sense that the painting could be this ongoing adventure um, and that I wouldn't really know where it was gonna end up. And that, um, but that, that this, this strange surface that gets left over could somehow speak to something that, you know, that went into the painting, the sort of remnants, um, the sort of history. It's not really pentimenti because you don't see those marks, but you see the buildup. And I was painting kind of in a very thin way at that time. So these were many, many layers that caused that sort of bubbly effect on the surface. Um, okay, next one. <laughs> 
Okay, and from there, um, fast forward to the next semester, again, another opportunity, you know, I, I think the beautiful thing about um, the studio schools, especially at that time um, where we had the certificate program um, was just a, a different sense of time, you know, there wasn't a rush to um, sort of define oneself um, and that you could take a really long time to work on something and that that has affected me for a long time since and just just that there could be different ideas about time that goes into a painting. Um, so this again was um, a full semester. We created the setup and the model took four positions. You can see the four um, model positions, hopefully. Um, and in this painting, I wasn't trying to find the rectangle anymore. Instead, I built from scratch um, with uh, a, fe a fellow person at the school, Steve Cope. And we built this together from scratch, a nine foot um, tondo. And it was really fun to build this. And then I was painting the model um, life size initially, and the model was standing very close to me. So it actually kind of, um, she kind of grew. So it's a larger than life size model. And when you look up, you see, um, I was sort of, she was standing right in front of me. So I had these multiple viewpoints. When I would look up, you could see sort of the bottom of her hat. And when I would look down, you could see the top of her feet. Um, so I sort of interested in this kind of warped bubble space that happened. Um, you can also see it on the right side where this uh, coat hanger was initially further in. And then as I worked my way out of the space, it got moved further out. So space and uh, the perception of it was also a very uh, big, it is and ongoingly is a big part of my work. Um, here, I was also looking to um, get as close to the local color as I could. So while still um, creating that depth and color space. Um, so those were some of the things that I was um, now thinking about in this painting. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I, I started to struggle with some things um, here. And one was the way that I, my relationship to the model felt very distant and I started to become more and more uncomfortable with that, that I was treating the model sort of like another prop in the setup, even though here was this live human being. Um, and I, I, I felt increasingly strange about that. And I also felt that I was sort of willfully trying to get this right, you know, trying to, you know, get this uh, precision. And um, so I, um, um, let's see, I'm just checking the time because I have to make sure I move along here. Um, so well, basically I, I started to realize that I was not addressing um, a whole other emotional side of myself that I had really disconnected myself from and it was becoming an issue um, and um, to the point where, um, yeah, you could go to the next one. These are some paintings that I did after the school. So I, I started to feel like there were two parts of me. I kind of like a split part, you know, the part that was trying to be, um, well, you could even go to the next one. Um, the part of me that was trying to look good, to sort of be perfect, to get it right you know, make an ambitious big painting and sort of override my emotions. You could go to the next one. And then there was this other side of me that was this dark, sort of isolated, brooding, angry side that maybe was more of the truth teller, maybe had something to offer. Um, next one. So I decided I, I actually wanted to see this darker side. And I set about in this group of paintings, um, to see what was going on behind the scenes. You could go to the next one. Um, you know, and you could go to the next one. What did I see inside the mirror? Um, I wanted to, you know, ask myself, you know, how do I see myself? 
what am I really looking at? Um, next one. And what is it I'm not willing to see about myself? Next one. How do I feed the different sides of myself? How do I feed the un, un, uh, unnourished parts of my soul? Next one. And uh, yeah, so this group of paintings, they were about um, trying to get closer to express maybe a, a side of my, my eating, my habits um, that um, were repressed even to myself. Um, and this just starting to unearth the, this imagery, um, I also went directly towards it. I didn't try to use metaphor or something to cover it up, but I wanted to try to, you know, as directly approach it as possible. Um, so I set up these still lives and um, these sort of after eating binge scenes and painted them, you know, for um, durations of time. Um, and this started to bring about a sort of um, healing in a way, uh, um, pulling the different pieces together somehow. Um, I was also looking at, you know, reading a lot of the poetry of Adrian Rich. Um, she talks, uh, this, is a, this is a quick quote. She says, our future depends on the sanity of each of us. And we have a profound stake beyond the personal in the project of describing our reality as candidly and as fully as we can to each other. So I'm trying to get at another reality that was maybe the one that I didn't want the public to see or you know, to be visible, but that I knew somehow by bringing it to light um, would be somehow a tool for growth. So in a way, these paintings became kind of a, you know, an exorcism of my own demons. Um, and then as I was painting them, I became more and more interested, um, we could go to the next one, in this kind of fracturing of, you know, the ripped and torn package, all this refuse, um, the things that were written on the packaging, you could see like joy um, and dream um, and, and also, um, you know, that the, I, I felt like the packaging was, the language of it was sort of sinister in a way, like it's again, trying to involve you in it. And yet it's, it's, uh, it's vacant in a way, it's not substantial. Um, and I became increasingly interested in how just the paint itself could speak to that fracturing, you know, like maybe a line that indicates the wrapper rather than a fully painted in wrapper. Um, or in the part where you see the cupcake there on the table, um, that that would be um, painted with a thicker paint, you know, like a more substantive paint area. Um, so I became interested in the different weights of paint and how they might read or speak to the subject matter. Next one. This is another um, binge painting and you could see in that it's a sort of different food group, <laughs> pizza and french fries. And um, there's a sentence in there that says, we love to see you smile. So I was finding sort of these strange sinister messages on the packaging. Next one. Oops, it's caught a little bit. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, we jumped through, but it's okay. We jumped. Um, should, should I go back? I think something happened on my end. That's okay. Do you want to try going back one? Another one? Well, yeah, you could show it quickly. Oh yeah, I'm back one more. <laughs> Um, this is the final of the binge paintings. Um, so you see again that sort of fracturing of the packaging and 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 these were all still lives that I made and painted from. So it meant that I was handling a lot of this material or it was sitting in my studio for a long time and I started really collecting it. I had 
uh, coffee cup collections. And um, this is just a small sampling of these food paintings. Um, but um, I had coffee cups, I had a collection of sugar packets, I had spoons, um, all these parts of this. Um, and then uh, next one, I also was um, built up these cakes because I got really interested in, you know, sort of the materiality of that paint and that that could um, really speak to more of like a sculptural aspect of the painting. Next one. And then this is my first uh, bottle caps painting where I, uh, you know, I sort of had to mask these caps again because this was the stuff that I was handling and I didn't know, you know, what what to do with it. <laughs> so I, I thought, why don't I try making a piece out of it? And so I made this cow head, um, which is sort of, you might be able to see, it's sort of busting out of this orange circle and you could see the nose at the bottom. And there are a lot of small uh, milk carton caps um, in there, two percent, one percent, skim milk, fat free, um, and so on. Um, next one, and this one has a big word on the top. It says "fun." Again, sort of playing with that idea that the, the packaging was sort of speaking to me. Um, you know, it's trying to tell me that I'm going to have fun consuming it. Um, and then maybe that's sort of a sinister message. Although I did really have fun making this piece. <laughs> um, next one. And the next one, um, this is a, a large, very quite large piece um, on the our largest dimension is six feet. And it's a cow standing in a feedlot. Um, the udders are extended downwards. Um, it, it's standing in a pool of urine. Um, this is just sort of my the way I'm thinking about it. And the head is not there because if you, you know, packed it not full with enough uh, antibiotics and so on, you didn't really need the head. You could just have the body to, um, you know, give you the milk you wanted. And in, in the upper corner, you could see a silo on the well, it's my left, but, um, and then uh, sun, sun in the background and that these sort of red udders mirroring the cow um, in the corners. Um, if you were to zoom in on this piece, you'd see a lot of medicine caps make up the body of the cow. Um, so kind of content heavy piece and I kind of crammed it all in there and um, um, it sort of, uh, yeah, really started, I, I guess, in a way, uh, focusing more on an external subject matter, a commentary on an external subject matter. Next one. This was a uh, sugar, could be a sugar packet, a salt packet, or something else like spirit. Maybe it's transforming from the, um, the, sort of seductive part into something else. Um, I was interested that the caps could be assembled in such a way they might have sort of a form to it. Um, there's sort of be a pressure to the piece and they sort of hung off the wall loosely. So there was some like, um, you know, sort of sense of it being a part of something that had been taken out um, rather than just sort of the solidity of this one piece. Next one. So this is where you see them kind of hanging out on a wall together in my studio. Okay, next slide. Um, and collaboration um, increasingly became part of my work. There's This is a series on the left of a, a group of mouths that I did with um, the artist Vera Hinamo. Um, and, you know, just thinking, I think, as the healing progressed um, and the integration progressed, um, just healing doesn't happen alone. And um, so working with others became more and more important to me and more a part of the work. Next slide. Um, at the top are a series of collages that I did with a poet, John Yao. He gave me the phrases, sweet, messy and vile cookies. 
Um, <laughs> and then I created out of cereal boxes um, these collages. The middle one, which you can't really see, says, um, what I wish to remember cannot be wished for. Um, and that was sort of um, hearkening to the landscape. Um, and the, the other one says Dross Resurrection Unit. And at the bottom is a collaboration I did with the artist, Wendy White. And um, we created sort of an installation that the paintings would be incorporated into. Um, so kind of broadening different ways and different entry points into the work. Next. Okay, so this, um, this painting is a bag of McDonald's trash. Um, so again, as sort of progressing and healing through this process, um, I became less interested in my own eating and more interested in maybe what I sometimes think of as sort of the collective binge. Um, so this is just a bag of trash I found um, on the street and I brought it back to my studio and opened it up and painted it. Um, it's a pivotal painting for me because something I noticed on this painting is I spent a year actually <laughs> working on this painting and um, I got to the end of it and a mouse jumped out and the painting was done. Um, but I, I realized something that, you know, why did this painting take a year? And I really sort of had a vision from the beginning when I started and beyond maybe that first week, I was kind of fussing with it. Um, and that that made me really question, um, could, I, could I go much more quickly towards my vision? Could I really um, you know, go quite directly towards it? Um, next slide. And so I started painting with one shots. That's when, um, after that painting, I pretty much decided to fully um, work with the one shot idea to paint an entire painting in a one shot session. And I did a whole number of these of painting refuse and garbage bags and, um, and um, some large, some small. And each one could therefore be sort of a quick different idea. I could sort of have an idea happen really quickly. Um, so in this one, um, this was just a one-time idea, but um, it, it was a big idea for me, a big shift in a way. So at the bottom, you could see that I um, inserted um, the palette on the painting surface itself. That's the, um, what you see at the bottom, that sort of messiness of paint. And I was painting some little scrap of paper or something, it looks like a little piece of popcorn or something, but, um, and, um, I was thinking a lot about sustainability at the time. This was about, um, yeah, it was like maybe 2008. And really, well, all throughout this work has been on my mind. But um, what if I have an outside disposable palette, let's say, or even those little remnants get scraped off a of glass palette, I felt strange about that. Like I'm creating refuse through my painting. So what if it was on the painting itself? Maybe um, that could be something. So I just did it, a one-shot painting. But something happened when I did this painting where I felt like there was the palette, there's me, the painter, the palette, and then the painting. Like almost like there were three of us suddenly instead of it just being me and the painting. Um, and I, it's, there's somehow this kind of space opened up and I felt, um, I felt kind of like the painting is now, you know, was starting to move towards me because it was coming to meet the palette and I'm coming to meet the palette. So it was sort of a new, a, a moment. Um, and that's sort of what the one shot paintings afford is sort of stopping at a moment when something happens versus keeping going um, to like quote, finish something. So I kind of held on to this moment and go to the next one. And I wanted to see if it would work with something living. And this is, you know, for my experience, so I painted this plant and sure enough, I had the same sensation of, you know, the painting coming to meet the palette. And I could then be sort of 
out, I'm coming to meet the palette. So <laughs> um, it felt like the painting was arriving versus me going after it. Next one. And then I tried this um, outdoors. Um, wow, that painting, so, yeah, I tried it outdoors. Um, I had been painting up until this point indoors in my studio, working with a lot of garbage. <laughs> And my uh, studio at graduate school was, had no windows. Um, and uh, prior to that, I had been doing a lot of art handling and working in the gallery white cube. And I increasingly, you know, in thinking about um, relating to the environment, I just felt like I really need to be in it. I need to be connecting to it. I mean, I can't just sort this out in my head. I have to be out there. Um, so I tried this one shot um painting idea with the palette outdoors and something again shifted um, up to this point when i had painted outdoors plein air i felt um a, it's subtle but i did feel a disconnect um, that i was sort of making a painting whereas here i felt like the painting was coming to me um, and i also liked that the palette um these movements that go into stirring the palette, um, the sort of gestures that would, would get lost, you know, in a palette that I would, you know, if it was disposable, let's say, that I would throw away, they would get lost. And here they sort of become players in the painting. Um, and they're sort of unconscious movements. So I liked the idea that there could be an image um, that sort of maybe that's more of a constructive type space. And then the palette representing a more unconscious type space and that those two could sort of coexist on the painting. So um, while kind of rudimentary, um, it, it was really thrilling for me to have this event happen. Um, next one. So I'll show you a number of these um, palette, early palette paintings, um, sometimes the palette be very um, exuberant and um, I'm sort of playing with like amounts of paint or they would make up, you know, the palette would become major color players in the painting. Um, and sometimes the painting itself became sort of secondary to the palette. Next one. Um, and sometimes the palette got more formed as the painting went on um, or another style of painting would suddenly enter in and I could just let it because I didn't, I was sort of just allowing the painting to come to me. Next one, or sort of certain moment in history or um, a certain type of light that maybe I had seen in another painting would enter in and I could just let it. Um, here the image is actually inserting itself into the palette. Next one. Um, Sorry, my files are a little large. That's why I'm doing this. Um, here's the palette um, sort of forming the side of a cliff edge. So, it, you know, sometimes the palette could actually be part of the image, um, but it was a, could be a spatial part, you know, sort of holding down that bottom edge. That was really exciting for me. Next one. Um, or the two would be sort of separate, you know, there's sort of be this separate world of the painting and then this um, area where the palette was having its own life, but that maybe the images, the structures of those two would sort of um, be talking to each other or contrasting each other. Next one. This was painted at night. There was a, lot, a huge sense of freedom to interact with the outdoors coming from these. Um, it gave me a lot a less sense of preciousness about um, what I was trying to accomplish and just letting the paintings come to me. Next one. Um, also, a lot of these are on found um, canvases um, or, or resourced. Um, canvases. Um, again, I like the way the palette could, you know, if it was like a linear movement, maybe that line ends up in the painting. Next one. This was a, a rare occasion where I painted um, twice. So there are actually two palettes here and they're sort of piling up and creating an image. Next one. 
Here are their little players on the bottom lining up. And you could see in the far left where something gets really stirred um, in the white section, but then it becomes sort of an animated figure in the mix. Next one. Um, see some of these um, collaborations also started to take the form of performances. Um, I did a performance of Janine and Tony's Loving Care, um, where I was using my body. Um, she painted a gallery floor with her hair. Um, and then in the second um, area where you see the black hole, um, a friend of mine, did Andrew Mickelson, did a show um, with a black hole and she asked me to come and paint with the ink from the hole as part of a performance. Um, so uh, an increasing sense of collaboration and an increasing sense of um, the, my body as an active player in the work. Next one. Um, this one, um, I start, the painting started to increase in complexity in relation to the palette. So you can see the linear um, palette on this painting. Um, this was just a fun one for me where I thought, hey, why don't I put every color that I have in my backpack on this painting? <laughs> so that's why there's sort of this long strip there and then use that paint to paint the painting. Um, I counted there's 45 uh, little, um, you know, two blobs here. Um, so uh, yeah, I carry a lot of material with me. That's part of um, the challenge of outdoor painting. Um, and this painting has a surface built up beneath it, um, which I can show you in the next slide. I was collecting my refuse in the studio and figuring out what to do with it. And I decided to hear, adhere it to wood. And then the next one, um, I gessoed over it and the next one, and it's, it's hard to see in this painting, but that this painting actually has this whole layer of refuse beneath it. And I started to really love that, that, that why did I have to paint, you know, on a flat surface? Could it, could it have sort of a terrain of its own? Um, I was thinking a little bit about landfills and how, um, you know, we sort of have our landscape, but there's could be other stuff underneath. Um, next one. And so this one has a shipping pallet beneath it. I stretched the canvas over the shipping pallet. And I again became excited on how the pallet at the bottom related to the image, which sort of has these linear um, components, which also related to the slats of the shipping pallet. And then, of course, the intimacy of a, of a landscape on, um, you know, place that's usually used for um, transporting goods. Um, next one. These are a pair of shoes that are attached to wood and that the canvas is then stretched around. And I was quite interested in how, again, the body, sort of this embodiment of the pressure of the shoes through the horizon. Um, and the palette started to occasionally get more mixed into the painting now. And I still don't have an outside palette, but I, but I became more used to the process. And so um, I, 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 I didn't hold tight to that it had to be this linear thing on the painting. Um, next one. But the palette still would be, you know, all the paint used is in the final painting. This is a pair of flip flops underneath the painting um, and you could sort of subtly make out those shapes. Next one. Um, and this is um, a palette painting again um, that you'll see in the next slide um, you could go to um, has now the caps around it. So this is about when the caps started to become um, frames for these palette paintings, the ones that I felt like were maybe slightly unresolved. Um, and I liked the idea that the color of the cap could then complete the painting. So now I'm, I'm almost at the most recent work. Um, next one. Um, yeah, people ask me sometimes if these, you know, the caps, do they have to do with the environment or, you know, global warming or, you know, um, climate change and 
Um, you know, yes, absolutely. This one was, uh, these caps were collected from the same location that the painting was painted at. Um, now this is like actual refuse from the landscape itself. Um, I became interested that that like more weathered color, what that would be like with the painting. Um, you know, and they're, they're made basically, um, again, letting all this material in um, to speak to a larger issue. Um, but I'm mean, not saying that these paintings will, you know, clean up a whole beach, but they may make something, some aspect of, you know, what we're dealing with visible. Um, and maybe illuminate my own um, feelings and concerns about it. Next one. And then um, this final group of works represents uh, these, um, again, a movement towards a greater physicality. Um, these surfaces, I took um, unstretched canvas outdoors and I'm working on a much larger scale. Um, these are also one shot paintings. Um, they are, so they have to be done in, you know, one session, they either work or they don't, but so there's sort of a, a tension and a risk and a pressure to them. They take a lot of energy, um, but there's also a lot of procrastination <laughs> that goes into um, this, the final result. Um, this one was actually dragged over the surface of the ground. So I was interested in different um, impacts of the actual terrain. Um, next one. Um, this one, um, again, there's no outside palette. So um, actually like kind of throwing the paint down, um, I have to work very quickly. Um, and I am i can't even see the whole painting as I'm working on it because of the scale. And I'm on my knees as I'm painting. Um, so that's where you see some like more gestural sense and, um, I still have a feeling for the space and I'm still observing, but I'm allowing a kind of physical influence into the painting. Next one. And this, you can start to see um, that this is on raw canvas. And so you see some of the texture of the ground coming up through the painting. These are recent, this is 2019. Um, so just letting in, again, letting in these different um, influences into the painting to kind of speak to um, um, more, you know, a sort of wider um, arena of sensations than I might otherwise get if I was to just be um, working towards a vista or an image. Next one. And I also, um, could start to let in more and more of the underpinning abstraction to um, let the, the um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to hustle so I know we're running out of time, but yeah. So um, I studied with um, Thomas Niskowski in graduate school and I was working observationally then as well. And, but having an abstract painter talk to me about my observational paintings over time really gave me much more confidence, I think, in the, the underpinnings of the abstraction. And so increasingly letting those speak. Um, and yet, I think you can still feel that there's a, a, a landscape sense to it, an outdoor painting sense to these, even when they become pretty abstract. Next one. So often I'm working, you know, capturing the light is changing and I have to work quickly or it's sort of the painting is coming together as um, things are shifting. And that was certainly the case with this one. So kind of having to sort of uh, let go of a lot of the control and just keep going after it. Um, next one. This was painted actually after dark outdoors and I, not only could I not see the rectangle, but I could not see anything. I couldn't see the colors I was working with. Um, that There's sort of a moon shape that you see in there. This canvas was, I dyed the canvas ahead of time, a kind of color, so there would be a ground to work with. 
Um, but other than that, I really was working completely with the physicality of, and of the place and the paint and what I was seeing and feeling and trusting that there was sort of a body memory to how this would come together. Next one. And these get restretched. Um, they get stretched back at my studio and I often restretch them many times. Um, probably this one was restretched about 10 times before I actually like found the rectangle that I was talking about earlier. So I'm still in that pursuit <laughs> of the rectangle. Um, you could see in this one, there's an area of sand at the bottom. So sometimes the natural materials enter the painting. And this bottom edge of this painting um, is where I would, um, where my, bud, my body would meet the canvas. So um, it's sort of like the space enters from there. Um, next one. And this I think is the final um, large painting painted at sunset on a dyed ground. So we're hitting the sunset of the lecture. <laughs> um, I think there's one more. And this is dusk. <laughs> So um, I, I'm really so grateful to um, had a chance to share with you tonight. I'm sorry that went on a little longer than I planned. The 45 minutes were a little bit over, but um, uh, there was kind of a lot to um, fit in and uh, there's a lot more I could share, but I'd love to just hear from any of you if there are any questions. Um, and yeah, thank you again for this opportunity to share. Thank you, Ilsa. It was really beautiful. And um, thank you for sharing and taking us on this journey. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't ask questions during because it, Ilsa was, was flowing. But um, so we've got some questions. If you have anything you would like to ask, please do put it in the chat or the Q&A as opposed to raising your hand and I'll do my best to get to them. Um, um, so, um, all right, just jumping into this. Um, Carol is asking, once you once you find the rectangle um, you want to stretch, does the remaining canvas exist behind? Um, when I re when I stretch the current outdoor paintings back at my studio, eventually, after I really feel like it's settled in, um, I cut I do cut that remaining edge. But part of the land the painted surface goes around. Actually, you could see in the painting behind me um, goes around the edge. Um, but there's still um, you know a sense as I'm painting it of knowing that this will be on a rectangle and sort of feeling for those edges. So it's definitely um, within the painting from the start, if that makes sense. I hope that answers the question. Um, Danny, Danny Licht is asking um, if you could say something about you, what you want from the rectangle. And I'm actually just curious how large those those last large paintings are. Yeah, those large ones are a range of, um, I think they're 48 by 60 in some cases. So kind of that range. Um, some of them are a little smaller. Like I think the first one was 40 by 48. Yeah. Um, and what is it? What is it? I'm I'm looking for from the rectangle. What is it I want from the rectangle? Yeah, <laughs> that's a loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> well, I think initially, you know, the painting that I showed from the days at the studio school, you know, the one that I was trying to find the rectangle. Um, you know, it was sort of like the Holy Grail in a way. It was sort of like this pilgrimage. Like if you were to find it, you would have found gold. Um, and I think over time it's, it's stuck with me that this is sort of um, this ground, these edges and this surface um, that we call the rectangle that has, you know, an inherent vertical and an inherent horizontal that those 
that that is sort of the playing field for the unknown to enter. So I guess in a way I'm still, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm answering the question totally, but it's sort of a, a hallowed ground or something. It's a space for something beyond the known to enter in for the adventure to begin and continue. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know that I'll ever find the rectangle, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I certainly am enjoying the search. <laughs> when you change the sizes of the rectangles, is it, do you sit with the painting? Like, are you sitting with the painting and then changing it? Or are you like, um, does it go through a lot of, you know, you said you change it, the size quite often for some of them. Well, that, so when I was saying that, I was referring to um, change the, um, the ones that I'm working unstretched. Um, I re I, I, yeah, so I would stretch this at my studio, um, but I would stretch it and then see, oh, it needs, you know, I need more of this on this side or that side. So I would re stretch it many times until I get until it clicks. Um, so I'm just sharing with you part of the process and how that, you know, old memory kind of still functions in these current paintings. Um, but I, but the one shots I was working on, well, these are one shots too, but I'm talking about the smaller palette paintings. They were found canvases. So just really working with whatever rectangle I was given to then find the painting on that rectangle. <laughs> um, Rebecca is asking, uh, she says, you mentioned the idea of time and creation without rush while studying at the studio school. Do you still have that feeling while creating your new work? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, well, I definitely feel that the one-shot paintings were trying to address that I didn't feel I had that, you know, and that um, some of those like binge paintings, let's say, or the caps pieces that would go on for a long period of time and they would start to feel like a struggle. And I wanted to kind of get back into that sense that the painting was everything, you know, that the time that I'm in the painting was everything. It was one thing to be in the bubble at the school where I could, it was everything every day, you know, but life outside <laughs> isn't necessarily like that. And sometimes it can feel hard to reconnect to an older painting that, you know, maybe if I was taken out of the painting, you know, going back to it and just kind of reasserting an idea versus the entire painting arriving at once in that moment. Um, was a way for me to connect in time and have, you know, kind of recapture some of that immediacy. Um, and, and that's valuable to me because I feel I'm, there's nothing else in that moment but me and the painting. And again, the palette sort of allowed in another space and time where the painting is sort of arriving and, um, I sort of feel like I'm listening for it when I'm making these. Yeah. Um, Thanks for the question. This, this question is from Charlotte. Um, and she's asking, when you work with such personal, emotional subject matter, how do you push through that vulnerability in order to show and share it? Thanks, Charlotte. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was actually really hard to show those images. Um, um, I think pushing through the vulnerability um, is really challenging. It's not, I'm not gonna, you know, sugarcoat it. <laughs> um, it's, I think being authentic with one's work is vulnerable um, and it, it can be, it can be really seem to be, seems, like it will be scary or something, but um, 
I guess, you know, the quote that I read from Adrian Rich um, maybe speaks to it, but just sort of confidence in the women that have gone before and them sharing themselves and their authentic experiences um, and the, the value that I derived from it in integrating and becoming a whole person myself, um, that has given me confidence to share as well. Um, but I think um, that while these, maybe the subject matter isn't as vulnerable, there's still a pretty vulnerable sense to the current work and that, um, yeah, they're outside of they're outside of what I know until they arrive. They're not idea based in the same way as those earlier subjects. Um, so another process question from Bill. He says, "Ilsa, thank you. So beautiful." Um, on the palette painting, do you put the paint down first, then look up and paint the scene in front of you? On the early palette paintings, the palette would come on first. You know, that's why you always saw it at the bottom of the painting. Um, and that was just really fun for me to lay out a palette. And then eventually, sometimes the palettes would like, it's like a piano keyboard. You know, you pick a different octave or you pick a different selection. and you know, you play a different song. So um, that was so much fun for me to work in color. I mean, I can only show you so many paintings, but <laughs> um, that is, is something that emerged over time from the palette paintings. Um, so they were all in the, the, the linear bottom. These larger paintings, it's different because I'm putting the paint, you know, sort of randomly where I see it. I have to work so quickly on these large surfaces and sometimes I add color as I go and then I'm pulling from these pools of color as I go as well. So um, over time, I've, I've started to put the palette just in the painting, you know, um, even sometimes as I go. And occasionally I, I sort of settle back into that old way of working where the palette again is on the bottom and um, sort of progress from there. Thanks for these great questions. <laughs> great questions tonight. Um, the, uh, there's some more, more technical questions. Um, uh, asking about, how, James is asking how that you attach the caps to each other. And Ian is asking if, um, if the caps become a source of local color for the painting. Um, so attaching, maybe we can go to a caps piece but um yeah the caps are attached um with wire and i drill a, a small hole into the painting um itself so they do puncture the actual object the painted object and then they're wired together and twisted on the back um my first ones i used a hammer and nail and it took forever <laughs> um but now this is sort of a smoother um, more fluid process um i'm not sure what the what that means about the question about the local color of the cap. Um, but I, I guess, you know, again, the, the way that I'm thinking about the colors of the caps is that they might expand the space of the painting, you know, so maybe the blue kind of pushes that distant space in the painting back um, or illuminates another color in the painting. So, I see it as a kind of color pressure um, on the painting that the two will, will work together in that way. Um, so, but the, but the caps themselves have such a predominant, you know, local color, I guess when you, it's another way of using the word that they are the color they are. I mean, you just, this is blue. I mean, <laughs> whereas the painting maybe in, inside of a painting, we just, the colors are, um, influencing each other in a different way that a, a black might actually be a green or, you know, um, I hope I'm answering the question. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, well, if anybody has another question to put in, I, I wanted to ask you what the, the title of the painting with the shoes was. Or if you if you title your work at all, actually. Oh, the titles. Yeah. Yeah, this one's called Seam, 
Um, that one is called Eddie. Um, the other shoe painting is called Emerald. Uh, the title, they all have titles. They're typically a one word title. Um, the titles, I think, point to something in the painting, but they don't, they don't, I, I realized at a certain point that the titles could be open ended um, and that they could, they could point to something in the painting, they could enhance something in the painting, but they didn't have the burden of uh, representing something in the painting. So they could be kind of open-ended and sort of material in a way. I guess I think of them also as material. So um, I could have a series of works that are titled the same, with the same letter. Um, and so they kind of have a functional purpose in that way. So then I know that the next one of, you know, this group or series will be titled with E. This one's called Every. <laughs> this is, these caps pieces often start with S. So this is sent, uh, sentiment, sentiment. I was thinking, you know, it sort of points to maybe a little something in it, the sort of sentimentality that we might have to these objects, like a little piece of a frame, maybe you could see on the left-hand side or a feather or um, a wrapper, you know, um, a sort of sentiment, but that it's, it, that it gets lost, you know, it gets lost and um, maybe now it's re-entering in another way um, with the painting. Um, so maybe just a couple more, if that's all right. Um, sure. Catherine is at, um, is asking, um, just curious, have you ever painted the caps with paint or do you always keep them as manufactured? I've never paint. I've had that suggested many times. Um, even back, you know, those first, the first cow head was 2002 or 2003. So I've been working on these for, uh, well, actually I, I did that early series of caps paintings and then I didn't do any for about 10 years. And I, I sort of um, uh, burdened myself with the idea that I really have to get rid of these caps. And eventually I reorganized my whole caps collection and then suddenly they popped back into the painting. Um, but I, I never have painted them. I, I usually am very, um, what's the word? <laughs> Willing with suggestions, but somehow with the caps, I really have wanted them to just be themselves. Um, and so I have not, I have not altered them ever from what they are. Although I think they start to transform maybe even more so in the recent works, um, where they become sort of a color sensation or maybe an aura surrounding the painting. Um, like if we were to go all the way back to the beginning, but, um, but, uh, yeah, I really, it's sort of like, I'm not, I just don't want to be changing them. I don't know, we'll see what happens, <laughs> I don't know. But I haven't wanted to <clears throat> alter them. Yeah, so that's the answer to that. Um, I, I kind of want to see how far I can take it without altering them. That's a good question. Well, um, uh, there's several comments here just you know, Carol says, thank you so much. And Allison Causer says, thank you for speaking on your healing process that you work through in paint. Your vulnerability and exploratory creative journey is inspiring. Thank you. Um, and wow. I'll just echo that too. It's a, really a wonderful talk. Also, thank you so much. Um, and thank you audience for, for tuning in tonight. Um, and I'll leave the last words to you, Elsa. Ooh, um, well, um, I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I wish we could uh, toast a glass of wine and it just yes. really loved having you here. I and, miss uh, those days, but um, I just, I just want to express my gratitude um, to, the, to the school and to my peers my the fellow alumni from the days when we were together at the school. I have some really deep, rich friendships from that time and 
also really adore um, the, the New York City School students and working with them. And um, and um, yeah, I'm very grateful. So I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, and and you, Sam, you're just. I, I, I always just appreciate your handling of these lectures so much and the generosity that you give to each person who comes to the table to share themselves. So thank you. Thank you for helping me through this process. Sure. It's, uh, it's been great having you. And um, I think, thanks again to everybody for joining. Um, we only have a couple lectures left at the season. So I hope you're able to join us for that. And Ilsa, I will see you on Thursday, probably. All right. <laughs> All right. <Have laughs> good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.